Welcome to another Liquid Bullet production. With us today is Mr. Albert Patrick. Thanks for coming, Albert. Pleasure. Um, so, can we just start? Can you tell us a little bit about your police experience? Certainly. I, I came to London in 1966, the last time England won the World Cup of football. <laughs> Make you laugh on that one. <laughs> and I was a, yeah, I was a young cadet uh, in South London. I uh, joined the regular force uh, a couple of years later. My first person was Bethan Green, then off to Chelsea as a de de uh, temporary detective. Back to Bethan Green, got promoted to Sarsen, went to Carter Street, Carter Street to Flying Squad, Flying Squad uh, to Brixton, loved it, was there for a long time. Carter Street in between, uh, then back on the Flying Squad, Murder Squad, and I ended up as the DCS head of uh, the CID in South East London. So that's a quick resume of my, and I had a great career, th 30 years, uh, loved it every day. Mrs. and kids never saw me, but you know, that, 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 that's how it is. Well, that's how it was. <laughs> so that, that's me, Albert Patrick, the uh, ex cop. So, can I just ask you, you've dealt with quite some big, high profile cases, haven't you? Certainly, yes, I have. Uh, I think the biggest one was Colin Ireland. He was a gay serial killer who, uh, who killed five men three in a week, and we tracked him down to South End, just across the water from here. Uh, and that, I learnt a lot in that. Uh, the best thing I learned from that investigation was going holiday because it was still there when I came back. So uh, uh, a great experience, media contact, uh, offender profile advice of interviewing. So that was a high pro and, and I'm still doing interviews on it now. Here we are 20 odd years later. Mm -hmm. So that, that was one of them. Uh, also in South London, I was uh, the SI who appointed to the Stephen Lawrence case, the fourth one. And I was tasked to deal with uh, Kent review 11 lines of inquiry. Uh, I, d I got on with that, dealt with that, appointed a deputy uh, and sadly uh, towards the end of uh, my career at that stage, I'd done 30 years by then, 
I was accused of corruption, uh, which I didn't like, but that was it. I cleared my name nine months later and retired, and that was based on uh, the defence asking questions about my 163. Uh, I was accused of corruption uh, by a supergrass detective, uh, and putting it bluntly, he was talking a load of rubbish. As far, and, and he hurt a lot of people, but that's life, uh, you move on. I went to work in the West Midlands, but I came bouncing back to the Met and did another 15 years as a civilian review officer. Uh, so, here I am. Yeah. Or, uh, there's, there's a few more if you want. You know, that, that, that's just one of them. Um, did you also do the uh, Raquel? Nicole yeah, yeah. I, I was a boss. I was the head of uh, CID in South East London. I had no hands-on dealing with Rachel Nickel, but, but when I came as civvy, I, I was aware of the, the, how it was sold. It was DNA on the on the on the part on exhibits that were found at the scene for Rachel Nickel, and obviously Co uh, Colin Stagg was the suspect at the time. Uh, I'll use the term blinker because they didn't look outside the left and right. Uh, the offender profile said it was definitely Stagg, and he never admitted, as you know, that they've done a program on it just this yeah, last week. Recently uh, come out again. Yeah, it's, it's come out again. Uh, but uh, when, when you look at it, my staff were dealing with uh, a man called Napper, who had killed Samantha Bissett in, mm -hmm. in Thamesmead. Uh, and when you look at that investigation, he had a map, uh, an A to Z, with a circle around it on the exact spot where Rachel Nickel uh, was, was killed on, on, on the common. Uh, and basically, Stagg was uh, seen on the common at the relevant time, picked up by an eyewitness. Uh, but he was, he, he was there. But he didn't do it. Simple as that. So, so recently you've become involved in the, the Essex boy case. Yes. The records of murders. Can I just ask you how you got involved in this? Certainly. Uh, David McKelvey, <coughs> excuse me, who's a retired DCI, he's an MD for a company called TMI. Uh, I wouldn't waste time telling you all about it because it's on the website for people to read. Uh, and he, he, March 2000 last year, he gave me a call and said, Albert, would you have a look at the Rettendon murders? I said, well, we're in lockdown. <laughs> I can't go too far from the four walls that I live in. <laughs> so I started reading uh, and I said, OK, what's, what, you know, who's involved? Who, who else has given you a hand? And he named uh, Steve Hobbs. Steve Hobbs was one of the best uh, de detectives I've ever worked with. Northern Ireland experience involved in reviews. Then we talk about uh, Tony Nash. Tony Nash, he was one of my best DCs. He retired the DCS and he is working uh, with uh, TMI in, in the West End work. And then we've got uh, a guy I don't know, never met before, Burge, Richard Burgess. He was from, he is, was a retired DI from Essex. So between the five of us, uh, we had, uh, uh, I was comfortable that we were in a group of uh, former detectives who knew what they were talking about, yeah. who had the experience and able to bring something to the table. So I, I agreed, and then the, the starter, how, well, the starter is uh, how do you go about a review? So, yeah. so how do you go about a review? Yeah. Well, a normal, I'll, I'll use the word, bear in mind, 15 years of doing serious crime reviews in the United Kingdom, one in Scotland, I did uh, the Sherman, uh, the Sherman uh, husband and wife who were killed by a gun up in uh, Skegness, uh, lots of others, and Rachel uh, Daniel Taylor, uh, uh, the, the Night Stalker, and lots of other high profile cases that I was involved in reviewing. So when I was working for the, for the Met as a civvy, I, I used the term the mad trail. Let me explain that. Messages, actions, documents, exhibits, statements. They are the principle of the Holmes account. Holmes account is Home Office, Large Major Inquiry System. And there's a routine to follow. So I would go, first thing I'd do would have an interview with the SIO to get his feeling as to where he was, what he was about. And then I'd go back to message one, action one, statement one, etc. And follow that through as to where they were. So I'm cross-referencing. So if a message says Albert Patrick killed Joe Bloggs, then I would want to see what actions have been raised and, and how far they got with that particular action. So that's called the mad trail and that's what I, was do what I did. And we'd still be doing if I was reviewing. That's called a progress review. There's other reviews that, uh, that are done to help the SIO, because when I say SIO, Senior Investigating Officer, it's all about 
helping and making sure they're on the right track. Because no one wants to see the wrong person convicted. I can assure you of that. Yeah. So has that been the same set out with the Wetterdon murders? <laughs> Good question. No, let, let me explain that one. David gave me a brief report. No statements, no action, no paperwork at all other than his report. Fortunately, there were quite a few, not all of them, uh, statements, etc., were on the Bernadome Homey website, which, which I, I read every single one of. Lots missing from there, I found out later. So that was a start for 10. Then, uh, looking at uh, social media, you had Crime Scene the Courtroom. Can I say now, they were excellent. The narrator there has done a brilliant job for the last two years. You can understand what he's saying. He's got a lot of common sense. Sometimes what he's saying is actually not accurate because I've picked up on that since. So, but he was excellent. Uh, Essex Boys have read uh, Blogs 19, a book by Darren Nichols, uh, and, and talked to key people that I knew were from Essex anyway. So that was at early stages. Uh, and, and that was working pro bono, not getting paid, not writing a book, not making a film, other than chatting yeah. to you here now. <laughs> uh, just to get across my point, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah. So that, 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 that was a start for 10. One other name, Anne, she was an excellent uh, defence. Uh, I, I think she's a clerk, but anyway, she, she's been working on the case from way, way back. And, and she has a, a brilliant knowledge of all the problems that there are in this, the right to murders. And she was excellent. I pick up the phone or email her and she came straight back to me. Then I got the defence case papers on a little disc that size, we'll show you that later in my yeah. small incident room. And then I got into the detail of following the mad trail. And, and very early on, you could see that Darren Nichols was the only evidence, concrete hard evidence, that convicted Steele and Wilms. So that, that, and, and, and I've dealt with super grasses. <laughs> I've supervised supergrasses, I've been there, seen there and done it, and I had real concerns that if you look at his account, it kept changing. You with me? I'm, I'll say to you now, Darren Nichols is a liar, right? Self-confessed liar, and he lied, he conned the judge and the jury to get a conviction because he was looking after number one. Yeah, because he, yeah, he, was, he was in trouble, and we can talk about that later. So where do you think Michael Steele was on the night of the murders? And the same for Jack Holmes? Yeah, certainly. Uh, they gave an alibi. Uh, uh, how that came out from the defence, I think a little bit too late, but we, we, that's how it is, that's uh, what it was. The law has changed on alibi now, you've got to give within a certain time. But if you look at Steele, the only evidence, if you rely on mobile phone, and I'm not relying on mobile phone, but he made a call at 1803 and 1809 from his mobile phone to Jack Booms. He, still says, he was in Bullpen collecting a, a trailer from Jack Booms' uncle who lived there. I think his name was Dennis. So that's where he was, and he rung him twice, wanted to find out exactly where it was, and the second I tell him I've got it, I'm on my way home. That is where you can play steel. The cell site, and we can, that's another debate and, and a very difficult one we need to air with you shortly. The cell site for the defence put him in Bullpan Village. The cell site from the provider's uh, witness put him in the car park of the halfway house. Yeah. So that is the, the evidence that the jury heard. So that is still. We know that uh, uh, in his defence, he bought petrol uh, up in uh, Ardley, which is north of Mark's Tay, and witnesses put him back in his, his house because he'd sold, sold his house and was moving into Meadow Cottage. So that is Michael Steele, yeah, as far as where he says he was. The next one is Jack Wombs, and Jack Wombs is slightly, I would say, probably stronger for the Crown than that Mick Steele's is that the cell site put him down workhouse lane, the crime scene. Right. That was for the Crown. The defence was that he was in the wheat chief and, if, and, and I beat the crime scene, I'm sure you have yourself, which is about half, uh, three quarters of a mile further down the road. And that's based on the line of sight and, and 
the information coming from the imprecise nature of cell site way back in 1995. Yeah. So it was imprecise and, and we know from the appeal court that it, it, that was satisfactorily proved by the defence at the appeal. So, so that, that's where they say they were. Uh, and he went there to collect, this is Jack Williams, went there to collect Darren Nichols' broken down Passat that was in the car park at the Quick Chief and he took it back up home to his garage. So that's what the defence is. And to be quite honest, I actually believe them. I really do believe that that is where those two gentlemen, those two men were on the 6th of December 1995, around 7pm. Okay. Can I ask you, um, have you actually been to the crime scene yourself? And what is your understanding of what happened there? Well, that, that's another thing. If I was reviewing a murder say today, that would be one of the first things I'd want to do. Yes, I've been to the crime scene twice, and, and this is, this is uh, a very interesting point. I'm walking down the lane and I can't find the crime scene. <laughs> it's changed. It's changed. Totally <laughs> different now. I'm it? looking, I've got the first bend, and I turn, and we turn right, I can't, no, something's yeah. changed here, and it yeah, has. And a voice from across to the right, there's a guy sitting on a tractor, says, can I help you? So over he comes down, didn't say who I was. He said, you lot cocked up, didn't you? He got the wrong people and the crime scene was down there and he didn't, and, uh, and the lot, wrong people were locked away. And that was Billy Thiebel, the brother of Peter who found him. Oh. And he used the same gem as, Mr., as, uh, as Tony Tucker. And it was a lovely chat, right? No, no hard evidence, but it was a lovely chat, and here we are, a complete stranger to me and vice versa. I think they knew who I was, really, because I, you know, I think once a cop, always a cop, or once a villain, always a villain. So he, it was good to chat to him, and he pointed out where the crime scene was, and I related it to it. So that was the first time. The second time was with the son, uh, where they did an interview, which cut me short a little bit, so I can add to that as, as we progress today. But yes, it been to them. What happened? I'm sure you'll put a picture of the Range Rover up on the screen as, as I described. And from my perspective, the crime scene was dealt at a poor standard, if I can uh, be polite. It wasn't that golden hour. You know, the SIO, two and a half hours before the time's up. What's that all about? So the crime scene was could have been dealt with a lot better and i'll give you an example of that if you come to my crime scene i'll stand at the end of the road and i'll i'll direct i won't go anywhere near it to begin with you want the experts fingerprints footprints uh, dna all that into your crime scene so that you can, first thing to do is video it i don't never know why it's videoed and take quality photographs lots of them another thing is you don't trek down the obvious route that they cut the range over got there because that was the only route you go around the fields you go outside and you come in closer to the crime scene it's, and you check that route to make sure there's no evidence there when i look at the photographs there's five coppers or four coppers traipsing over the other side of the gate again what's that all about why are those uh, senior detectives allowed into the crime scene before the examination is finished. They run out of time, and I, I, when I say run out of time, the weather changed, the, I think the sun came out and melted the snow, so you've got the, the marks in the snow if there were any melting away, but underneath that there's mud, and there's still going to be a mark underneath the snow, in my humble opinion and experience, so just because the snow's melted, it doesn't mean to say there ain't a footprint got you. in the mud it's underneath still in, in bed yeah, like a footprint. Of course, yeah. And another thing, another one for me is not getting the body temperatures of the of, uh, Tate Tucker and Rolf in the Range Rover and the Range Rover itself is, is just poor, poor management. Sorry, but that's a criticism. I'll lay with them and that should have been done. Doesn't mean to say that the pathologist or the doctor is going to give you the exact time of death, but you know no, from the, from the Crown's time. case, it's 18.59, 7 o'clock, and the defence case, it's midnight. And, and we'll talk that when I take you into my incident room. So, so that, that's, and, and there's, there's others. You've got the lack of frost on the Range Rover. You've got the deposit of carbon at the, at, at the bottom of the exhaust pipe in the snow and in the water. Uh, no, if, you, if, you, if Nichols is telling the truth and he's dropped Jack Wombs off at the top of the lane, where are his size 12 brand new welly bookmarks in the snow 
down to the fire barn gate, down to the crime scene. He probably took a couple of minutes to walk down there. And the next one is, if he's telling the truth, where are, somewhere in that snow and somewhere in that mud, somewhere at that crime scene, the second pair of size 12 brand new Wellington boots that Michael Steele is wearing must be, in my view, in the snow, going back in the other direction to the top of the lane to get in to the Passat. And if you look at the Passat, if you have used a vehicle to assassinate three men, it ain't going to be around after day one or day two. Guess what? The Passat is found by Essex Place, is examined, no DNA, no fingerprints, no bit of firearms residue, but not from the murder weapon that was used at the crime scene. And, and here we have a vehicle, it's got uh, poor uh, oil was running out of it. It was, it was a run-down vehicle, that's probably why it broke down. That's why I needed to turn away. So, so there was actually fire residue from... There was, there was, there was fire, maybe, di yeah. different weapon, but in the back. But when you look at Nichols, he used to go clay pigeon shooting ah, right. with a few people that we could name if, if, if it was necessary. So he had uh, taken uh, people clay pigeon shooting, and that is why I think there was residue yeah, in it. And, yeah, and, and, then go, and then going back to the crime scene as well, uh, for me, there was only one gunman. That's what the forensic evidence from the firearms said. One gunman. You've got the foot mark, the trainer mark at the back right hand door. In, I think it's three shots to begin with. One, two, three, first straight away. Eight shots altogether. Only seven bullets found, uh, cartridges found. But I think one's still in the chamber, and that's why there's only seven. Wow. Only one gun used. That's exactly what they said. And they were assassinated. Now this just wasn't, oh, I don't like you, I'm going to kill you and shoot you. This was planned, deliberate and punishment and I've said that already. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 that, uh, and we're not finished yet, there's still work to be done. We're, we're calling on a, a pathologist, a, an expert, uh, Dr. Shepherd. Uh, we want him to look at it. I also want the results of all the exhibits that were seized 26 years ago to be re-examined because they must be somewhere in the lab. Uh, uh, my frustration is that if I was still in a job as a saver of cop, I could make a call and say, check that out, please, get that done, find me where Joe Bloggs lives, do all the basics that you have the power to do as a, as a, a saver, an employee of whoever. I'm, I'm just a retired old man living in Kent who has got no, no real access to an awful lot, but I ain't giving up. Um, so, apart from Darrell Nichols' testimony, is there any evidence that Im implicated Steele and Holmes in the murders? Uh, I've looked yesterday's, and, and, and is it called corroboration, or is it strong enough to convince the jury? Well, uh, sadly it did, and, and the only evidence, apart from Nichols' lies, Nichols' evidence, is the, the mobile phones, I, I've talked about already. Mm -hmm. But be careful on that one, because in 1995, the words to be used by the senior police officers in the country was that that evidence at that early time was imprecise. Because if you've got the provider saying X and the defence saying Y, and you look at the reasons why, it is imprecise. It's unsafe to rely on that evidence. And a prime example is the line of sight from Bullpen to a halfway house, there's a thing called Judy Hill in the way. And when you look at the graphics on that, which I'm spending time on now, and I've had great help from a man called Roy, don't know, I won't say who he is uh, totally, but he has been excellent, and he has he's got uh, knowledge of phone evidence better than I have, and he has highlighted to me that there are concerns about various lines of sight. I'm a defence uh, expert, David Bristow, who is an excellent uh, expert witness that I have used historically. So there is a concern, and that was only evidence. So you've got those two key calls and others that uh, point the finger at uh, Wombs and Steele. Yeah, just, just from my own sort of perspective there, obviously sometimes using the car sat-nav, sometimes it puts you in like a wrong road or two up. And that's from nowadays technology. I mean, going back 25 years, that was probably you got, uh, a they, lot they, worse, you've so. said you've, you've said it in one. I listen. I reviewed a case a year later at the, the Sherman's, yeah, the the, the 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 guns up in up in Skegness, and their cell site evidence had moved on 
tremendous amount from this case from the Red to 95. And it's all about pinging off up there, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas before, it, it was an analogue phone, so you didn't have that expertise. Some phones you could say, yeah, that's probably right and much more accurate. But in the Retiton case, yeah, and this is one of the main points of appeal, and I think the appeal judges said, yes, you're right, but the judge had warned the jury to be careful around the cell site evidence. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a tough call for me. Yeah. And then when you look at the history of, of Nichols and going abroad on the drugs, they, they, got, they got married up. The, and the other evidence is, you've got Sarah Saunders uh, <coughs> saying that uh, she had warned Mickey Steele that uh, Pat Tate was going to kill him over a drugs deal, it had gone wrong. And you had Donna Jagger saying that when she'd left Craig Rolfe's company that, uh, at, at that evening from, she says, from uh, Lakeside when she'd been dropped off to get a new dress, that he, that he, Craig Rolfe, said he's off to meet Mickey, the pilot, with Pat Tate. Yeah, so that, that was her evidence. Uh, and I'll say now, if you look, and there's others on social media have looked at it. She said at a press conference, uh, after the press conference, and her statement is not, and this is not taken until two months later. So what's that all about? You with me? So uh, uh, she, again, she was a protected witness. Uh, and if you look at what she said happened in the totality of the investigation, she's close to being pointed in the same position as Nichols. I think she's lying. Not lying totally, but some of the key issues she's raised uh, I'm saying to you, Lee, she was lying. Yeah, covering up. Yeah, covering up. Well, um, what was the motive for the murders? Well, the Crown's case was it was over a bad drugs deal that, uh, that Nichols had dumped some of it in an art pit in Essex and then he tells his handler, his police handler, where it is and he gets paid 400 quid for it and gives the handler a drink. So <laughs> that for me is, is corruption. It is simplest and worst. So that, that's, that's the Crown's case. Park the the, the the DCB side of it and Nichols, but that is that they had gone across uh, to Holland, got the drugs, brought it back, it was poor quality, uh, and there was a row between uh, the, the people who had put the money in, and Steele was to blame for it. And uh, so Steele got in early, and, and he, he, killed, he ordered the killing of, was involved in the killing of Tate, Tucker, and Rolf. But when you look at that, they actually got the money back. They actually got most of the drugs back. And there was no real, real loss to what happened on that particular day. And Tate had only just come out of prison. He'd only been out five, six weeks. And if you, if you look at, if you, Sarah Saunders will tell you, and she was the, uh, Pat Tate's wife, uh, partner at the time, the young boy. Uh, she never, ever believed that Michael Steele was guilty and we've spoken to her since and she still to this day uh, believes that he was not involved in any way shape or form in the assassination of, of her partner and others. So that, that, that was, uh, that, that was that's not, uh, not hard evidence but it's, uh, it, it, it's another tick in the right direction from where we're coming from yeah. as to saying this is an unsafe conviction. Just, just going over what you said there about um, Nichols. Wasn't it, um, didn't it come up that he was actually working with policemen um, to, to, to do it with the drugs or something? Right, let, let me talk you through the system of a, a snout, an informant, a chiz, whatever you want to call them. In my day, they were called uh, informants. Uh, they, they were paid uh, villains, criminals, who gave information, they stitched up the mates, gave information to a police officer who was the handler, and he would record what he was saying. In, in, on his file, you fill in the information sheet, it would go into the controller, which was uh, at least my rank, DCI at the time. I've been a, a handler, a controller, and a registrar of informant. So that was the system. The day that Nichols was registered as a Ken, uh, as an Essex informant is question mark, but he definitely was an informant. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, they're called chizzes now, covert human intelligence uh, assisted, uh, so get the exact words of it. So, so he was an informant who was paid uh, to give information. And if you look at the interviews of DC Burns, you'll see that 
there was an unhealthy relationship between the pair of them. So that, that's how it was. So yes, he was an informant, but when was he registered is something I haven't gotten to the bottom yet. Wow. Was it before the murders or was it after the murders? But most certainly, if I had a snout, an informant, and, they had, and three men had been murdered in Essex and I was close to it, or the, the informant was close to it, the first thing I'd be doing on the phone, look, find out who's done it, please, tell me what the score is. There's obviously going to be a reward. Yeah, Start talking, uh, uh, find out what you know. And you would expect that to be recorded and come back, can't find a thing, or the rumour is, or you've charged the wrong people. What's to that effect? Yeah. Nothing on his file to that effect. So, so was this story true that uh, we heard that um, Nichols first got stopped by the police and he had a boot full of cannabis? Let me, let, yeah, th this is interesting because DC, I'll start again, Dave McKelvey was a DC in 1995 and Dave McKelvey arrested Nichols for drug importation or no, possession of drugs. And then what happened the day before they had more cops in the world surrounding this team, and that was Steele, Wombs, uh, others who've been, uh, forget the names of them, including Pat Tate's brother, Russell. So you've got an importation that's come across the North Sea on a rib, and it's uh, dropped around Clacton, and it ends up in Michael Steele's mother's garage. So you've got a big consignment that's arrived in the country, Mr. Steele is a very clever man and he manoeuvred the drop-off point so they didn't get it on the sandbank, on the, on the you know, caught bank of rights as it's coming off the boat. Mm -hmm. But they, they didn't worry because they had technical assistance in place and it, it was able to identify where they were, which was in his mum's garage. So the next day, Nichols, and because uh, the police had uh, most of the phones, and listened to, they knew that Nichols was coming in the direction of Steel. He came there with his mate, he was driving a Jaguar, his mate was driving the transit van, and off they go. David McKelvey was given the task of doing a hard stop on the Jaguar and the van, and they did that. But he kept a safe distance, he didn't want to show it initially until the drugs were found. Meanwhile, Nichols is on the phone, and guess who he's talking to? One, he's talking to Mr. Steel. And second, he's talking to DC Bird, right? So that there, there's and and what they said, I, I'm I'm not privy to, but there's a fair chance to say, I'm getting nicked. What's that effect? Sort it out here with me. So, who was the principal? Was it Bird or was it uh, Steele? Open debate on that one because I haven't I haven't had enough information to satisfy me as to who was the principal mm -hmm. in the van. Eventually, this uh, stack of cannabis is found, uh, being driven by Nichols's, uh, I forget his name, uh, friend, I could, I could get it if it needed to be. Uh, Nichols puts his hands up and says it's mine, so he's arrested as well. So off he goes. Then he says, can I bring my DC hand up? Because that's what he asked. Uh, and they said, no, he's been nicked as well. And then he's told he's arrested uh, and on suspicion of the murders. And then within an hour or two hours, he starts doing that. And that's exactly what happened. So the actual police officer was arrested as well? Yes. Yeah. Two of them, man. Two of them? Yeah. On the same day? I yeah, I, yeah. And that was on the 16th, of, uh, June, May, May 1996. 13th of May 1996. So what do, you, what do you hope to achieve in the months coming ahead? I'll have to look at my notes on that one, Lee, because I would like to achieve an awful lot, but I think mm -hmm. the principle is that Michael still gets out. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and when you look at it, you've got Jack Wombs out, model prisoner. Uh, I've read his interview, uh, his interview with the police, and more times I've had dinners. When it comes to drugs, no comment. When it comes to murder, he doesn't say no comment. He gives an answer, he says, I did not murder them. And, and I've, as I said, I've read his answers, and he constantly says, I did not murder. Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Yeah, so that's in right, that's from his mouth and it's on the interview. So that's Wombs, yes. As far as Steele is concerned, he's an obnoxious gentleman who I've interviewed twice 
uh, he's older than me, he's 78 years of age, and he's category A. Right, so that's still a long time to be in and still be a category Well, he's, he's gone past it. Well, he got 15 years to begin with, so the judge has given him 15 years after the conviction, and then the Home Secretary's increased it to 25. Well, he's past that now, and, or almost past that, and he's still locked away category A. Now, I hate to say it, when you look at the Crown's evidence against him, yeah, it's only Nichols is saying he was at the crime scene with a gun. Absolute rubbish. There was only one gun used at the crime scene. Okay, he might have given it, you know, swapped the gun and, and fired it. All right, I can accept that. But that's not what Nichols is saying. Yeah, so here we have a 78-year-old, very clever, very intelligent man, yeah, who, uh, as I said, I can show you the reports he's sending me. He's been keeping in touch. And the main, the main thing that I and TMI have got to be careful about is that we don't influence or upset or annoy CCRC, Criminal Cases Review Commission, or the Parole Board, or do anything that would jeopardise his freedom, albeit if it's a week away or two weeks away, three weeks away or a year away. So if we were to say X, Y and Z, which we've uncovered, that we're concerned about the timeline, concerned about uh, the, the, <coughs> the forensics, all the issues that we've and we haven't even talked about Billy Jasper's account yet. So if we bring that to the table now, all that is going to do is delay any decision that the CCRC are going to make. They had the last application three years ago, and guess what? They're still waiting, the defence team, to find out what that's all about. And that was about lack of disclosure over a police operation where Fred Smith said, I'm going to take the contract out to kill the killers of Les, uh, uh, Lee, Lee Betts, uh, is it Lee Betts, yeah? The, the little girl who had the exes there in the night. Lee Betts, yeah. That's it, Lee Betts. So you're asking the question, what I want to achieve. Yeah. Right, here we go. <laughs> the reason for me sitting here with you daily is that I want to appeal to the public of Essex uh, and to any witnesses who the police interviewed way back in 1995 to have a, a serious think about what they can tell us, the review team. And, and by way of example, we've got one, who, one girl who's come forward who says, I didn't tell any lies in my statement other than I, I could have, I, I, I could have, I did see the Range Rover leaving Gordon Road and I did not wait in the car outside. I went inside to get ready for Pat Tate to return, as he said he would, because he called my mum to say it. She charged her phone up and she rung him and he couldn't get an answer. She couldn't get an answer. So she eventually went home about nine o'clock. Right, so all we've got there is, she still said that she went to the address, but she's now saying that she saw them and she made a call on her mobile. That call is nowhere in any of the schedules that uh, the, the Essex police have disclosed to the defence. So that's a question mark for me, what's that all about? Yeah, so yeah. why is that one missing? Yeah, from absolutely right. We've, we've also got Sarah Saunders who has confirmed that uh, she doesn't believe in any way, shape or form that Michael Steele was involved in the murders. Yeah, yeah. and then <coughs> what else have we got? So that, that that's two witnesses who not enough to go before the CCRC, but when you look at the totality of what we got, then then there are concerns there. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I would like personally to speak to the SIO, and that's Mr. Dibley. Uh, Mr. Uh, there was also the, the guy who took over from Sibley, I think his name, and Barrington, the senior cops of Essex who were involved in 1995. I would like to talk to. Detective Chief from Town, read as he was then, who was in charge of Operation Obtain, which was the the revisit, the relook at the challenges that the defence had put up about the mobile phone evidence and about Nichols being paid uh, and seeing Tony Thompson before he gave his evidence. So I would like to speak to him because he was told to do certain things by the CCRC. So it'd be good to speak to him. And, and, and lastly, on, on speaking, is any cops in Essex who, at the time, you know, have got now 
any concerns about what happened. And, and if, if they come up with evidence that says, look, 100% Albert, you've got it wrong, X, Y, and Z, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm man enough to live with that. I'm, I'm happy to accept it. I don't know everything, but I'm appealing, please, to people who have changed their allegiance. Like, there was lovely, about 10 girlfriends, all connected to the three of them at various stages in their life. Now, do they know more yeah, than, than they said at the time? And, and one particular one, and, and her name is Lizzie, and she made a statement to, to the police, and the lady detective who took the statement wrote a note with the statement to say, I don't think she's telling the truth, she's worth a revisit. That's all she said. Never ever was a revisit to Lizzie made. And when you look at Lizzie's evidence, she was one of the girlfriends of Pat Tate. He had given her a polo that had gone into Basel and Tire Company on the 6th to get repairs. Yeah. And if you look at the sightings of Tate, Tuck and Rolf and the Range Rover on the 6th, you've got a witness called Andrew Reynolds who worked at Basel and Tire Company who saw them in the Range Rover literally two seconds away from the end of the road where Bazantar Company is. So Lizzie never, I never asked, never says anything about the polo. My question is, did Tate go and pick up the polo and drive it off to hand it over to Lizzie? Yeah, or did Lizzie come and pick it up? Just need that clarified. And there's a few other questions as well. So, and I know it's difficult because 25 years down the road, they don't want you know to revisit and reinvent, which was a sad, terrible time in their lives. But just remind them, two guys have been locked away for 25 years, and they didn't do it. They are not guilty. Simple as that. That is my honest opinion. It's also the impact on their, the rest of their families and the uh, absolutely. If, if you look at, you, you, you've seen the interview of John. Uh, the brother, you've seen the interview of Mum, uh, Mrs. Wilms. We've, we've talked to Jackie, uh, who is the partner, uh, wife of uh, Michael Steele. Uh, she, she was with me. She, if, I think if she'd given evidence at the trial physically, it could have made a difference. But she, she'd been waiting there for about four weeks to give her evidence, and in the end, she just couldn't hack it anymore. And the doctor said she wasn't well enough to give her evidence. But she corroborated her husband's alibi. Okay, people say your wife's going to you know, lie for the husband, etc. But 25 years later, us as retired uh, experienced cops have interviewed her and she's still saying exactly the same. Mm -hmm. and, and without waffling, without thinking, oh, I can't remember, honestly, off the, off the heart, she's told us uh, exactly what happened that day. And it was driving a bullpen in a Renault and they got petrol, they didn't get diesel, and they didn't go anywhere near Rettenden. It's simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, simple as that. <laughs> what else? Have I mentioned another? Yeah, and, and, an expert on frost. I'm keen to establish an expert on frost and carbon because I still haven't bottomed that one out yet. Uh, anyone who, who was at the crime scene or in the wheat sheaf who can talk about any vehicle or so, and I'll give an example with Jack Wilms. He said he went there at the directions of Nichols to pick up his car. He puts on his low loader. He's got a great big blue transit van. He's got a loader at the back and he's got a Passat. And if you've been to, if you were you around in 1995 and a half yeah. part of Well, you didn't have the brand new 130, did you? No, the main the old, road, the, the, the old road is where, where the murders happened. And it, it's rush out, it's snow and it's cold, it's miserable, it's wet. That was a busy road, particularly going from London out to no, it was north and south, wasn't it? It was up to Chelmsford. So anybody uh, around the wheat sheaf about 7 o'clock on the 6th who saw the van and the Passat pulling off the car park just to make contact with TMI because they like to talk to them. There's, there's a guy called Mr Wright, three or four years or even much longer than that, spoke to the defence team uh, and said that I actually saw the Range Rover uh, much later in the night, near enough midnight, around the turnpike. There were statements who gave to the defence, we can't find them, or I can't find them, the defence can't find them, and the CCRC took statements from them. We would like to have a look at those statements just to see what they, what they said and if we can build on 
their evidence because that's never been before a court, uh, never been before any appeal court, or at least never heard at the trial. But they never came forward till year. So we'd like them, his name's Mr. Wright, and his wife and others uh, to come forward as well so that uh, we can uh, try and understand what happened. Let's have a look at my notes, see if there's any more. I, I've, I think I've mentioned Chris Bowen, the defence solicitor, very keen to uh, talk to him. I know he, he, he became ill uh, and, and uh, he won't talk, but I think it's important now for me to understand what happened in the early days of the defence case, just to put, you know, just to put some uh, meat onto what I, underst I understand so far. It's simple as that. And, and I would like the Chief Constable of Essex and the Police Commissioner of Essex to have the ball to pick up the phone and say, right, come and tell us what you know, Albert. Simple as that. Forget about all this politics about going through the right channels. Man to man, right? Me and the Chief, listen to what we as a group of senior experienced detectives are saying. Okay, they might have said it's been before the appeal court, it might have been before the CCRC. I spent 15 years reviewing murders, I know what I'm doing, right? I've got all that experience behind me. I've dealt with dangerous informants, I've managed the media to a good standard so I know the issues there. And there is, there is genuine concern from me and David and Steve and, and Tony and Burge that they didn't do it. Yeah. And if they did do it, the just evidence, to listen to you anyway. If we well, that, that, that's exactly. It doesn't make if sense you, not to. Listen. If you look at social media and email, and I don't do Facebook, but if you look at the others, exactly that. Yeah, you with me? Exactly that. Don't keep sending me letters saying go for the CCRC. Listen, the last time the defence did that three years ago, and they still haven't got result. I'll be in a box before we get result. You with me? So, yeah. so come on, guys, shape up, do the right thing, listen to what I'm saying. I was comm commended by the, the people who did the Daniel Morgan uh, reinvestigation that happened years ago. I was the boss from South East London, as I said, uh, and I'm complimented. It wasn't just me, it was the team that I had at the time we did it, around the quality of the decision logs uh, that we had, uh, that we had uh, recorded as a result of the Hampshire saying they couldn't, there was no evidence to charge, won't bore you with the details. So, in the Daniel Morgan case, yeah, they're saying, oh, Mr. Patrick knows what he's doing, that the quality there is of a, of a good standard, end of, right? Never, never talked about it, and no one's going to ask me about it because it's just not good news. <laughs> that is another uh, issue that uh, I would uh, be concerned about, that they're not listening to us. Yeah. Do you that. think, obviously, there's a few rumours about that, obviously, the police couldn't get him. Uh, Michael Steele for the drugs importation, so they're punishing him because they couldn't get him for that for the murders. Do you think that could be a, a part of it? So this is this grey area I've got. The big question I have got: Why was Darren Nichols in Redden at 1848 when he uses his mobile phone, yeah, uh, to check his voicemail, and he then gets a call at 1859 allegedly from Jack Wilms to come and collect me? That's my, 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 my biggest concern. And, and who... It's easy to sit here and criticise the old bill, right? And the cops. And as a retired tech, I don't particularly want to do that. Not, not being brutal, I, say, I don't want to do that. Because listen, I had a great time in the job, yeah? Best, best time in my whole life. And, I, and, I, and I, 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 I take the view that I was a good cop and I did a great job, put a lot of bad people away. And if anybody came forward and said, Albert, you got that one wrong, I would be the first to say, OK, tell me why I got it wrong. That, that, that's just me as a human being. I'm not getting those vibes from Essex. Yeah? Yeah. So I, I think there's, I, I think it's a bit of lack of experience. You with me just out of the depth. You've got to be a particular type of guy. You with me? To, like, you've got to find out how a man died. You've got to, sorry, I'll start again. To find out how a man died, you've got to find out how he lived. And if you make an appeal on television for X, Y, and Z to come forward, or you get a message in saying uh, it, Fred Smith did it, then you've got to bottom that out. You have got to look at everything. And, and we haven't come to Billy Jasper yet, but I'll explain 
what Essex Police did not do about the Billy Jasper account that is just unbelievable. It's either corrupt or it's totally out of the depth. Yeah, because if if you've got a, 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 a information that's, as I say, that uh, says that Billy Jasper uh, or Albert Patrick did it, you've got to bottom it out and they haven't done that. When I say bottom out, you've got to do the magistrate. You've got to go into everything that is available to you to see if you can corroborate what's been said. So Essex Police, uh, I think Customs to begin with, were struggling to arrest him. So that was the start of a 10. Yep. He only got nine years for the help for the flying and the pilot. Yeah, so, so I think they probably had to hunt with that. Uh, and I use the word blinker much like uh, stag. This was a blinker investigation. And that's why when I talked to Mr Dibley and Story and Barrington, they were the guys, they were the senior cops in charge, convinced me that they got it right. Yeah. Now they'll say, you know, as historically with the jury found them guilty, sometimes the juries get it wrong. Simple as that. And, and was it a fit up? Uh, I, I'm not going to go as strong as that. But there's issues that when you look at Darren Nichols' account, when, when, uh, listen, I've looked after Supergrass, and my boss has told me he's a young DS, Albert, keep him sweet. Right? Look after them, give them what they want, etc. Was I buying their evidence? And his name was Fury, and, and I nick Brian Reader on the back of it, and Gervais and Goodwin, all, all those people historically I can put, bring to the table, as we do, because we meet uh, once a month to, to talk through what we've uncovered. As do a, you as think, though, that the, um, like you say, the, the, Essex, the old Essex police won't talk to you? If there was a doubt that you know, this man spent that many years in prison for something he didn't do, you'd think they'd you know, feel a little bit bad that he, he's still sitting there and want to help the case, wouldn't you? Lee, pick up the phone and tell him. Go on, pick up the phone and say, I've just spent a, a, a Sunday morning with Albert Patrick. He's a genuine geezer. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. He made a mistake. Have the guts to talk to him as a human being. It, it seems to be a bit more of like uh, they don't want to lose their image or to put their hands up and say, we've got it wrong, they just want to keep going. And, but you know, the innocent man is still suffering in that case. Just for a bit of status to say he's right. They're playing a the political game, right? The political game is CCRC. I've got to be careful, we, TMI, have got to be careful that we don't damage Mickey Steele's opportunity to get out, which will hopefully will take place next year. But when that's achieved, then what do I want out of it? What I want out of it is for the truth to be uncovered. Lee, this case will never be solved. Right, when I say solved, the person and the people responsible for blowing away Tucker, Tate and Rolf will never appear in court, unless we find three super grasses who all tell lies together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking the uh, make a little bit, but you hear where I'm coming from, is that there is no forensic evidence, there's no eyewitness, there's no CCTV, it was a poor investigation, and the Essex police got it wrong. Simple as that. So Albert, we try and wrap this up now as part one. Um, part two is coming soon, there's going to be a lot more details into the Billy Jasper side, so stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Lee.